everyone! This short film is going to take you step by step through a really interesting article by Mark Weiser. The article is called The Computer for the 21st Century and it was published in 1991 in Scientific American. This awesome film was directed, produced, and illustrated by a multi-talented genius, clearly. So this is Mark Weiser. Mark Weiser. He had a beard and a lab coat because he was the chief scientist at Xerox Park or the Palo Alto Research Center. Mark Weiser is often known as the father of ubiquitous computing or the idea that someday computers will become weaved into the fabric of everyday life and objects. We'll unpack this idea later. Actually, Mark probably never wore a lab coat, and if he did, it wasn't see-through. That's kind of weird. In his seminal article, Weiser discusses the current state of computing, his research, and his predictions for the future. He begins by suggesting that the most profound technologies are those that disappear into the background. They become so embedded into the natural environment that they actually become indistinguishable from everyday life. This is everyday life, in case you're wondering. Writing is a great example of an invisible, ubiquitous technology. It is a symbolic representation of spoken language. Writing, as Weiser sees it, freed information from the limitations of individual memory. From newspapers to billboards to street signs, we are completely surrounded by it. It is a constant background presence that does not require our active attention. We interact with writing almost unconsciously. So, Weiser contends that silicon-based information technology, such as computers, are far from being part of the natural environment, like writing. Computers are only approachable through a complex jargon that has nothing to do with the tasks for which people actually use computers. The individual or personal computer is just a transitional step, Weiser argues. He proposes a new way of thinking about computers in the world that takes into account the natural human environment. This is a world in which computers would vanish into the background just as street signs do today. This disappearance prefaces the idea that whenever people learn something sufficiently, they cease to be aware of it. Various scholars have attached a variety of names to this concept. Compiling, visual invariance, tacit dimension, the horizon, ready to hand, and periphery. Weiser suggests that two present-day trends get in the way of the quest to integrate computers seamlessly. The first is a mistaken understanding of the concept of ubiquitous technology. Does that mean a technology I can take everywhere, like to the beach, or to the jungle, and even the airport? No. This attitude places all the demands for your attention on one screen. That's kind of the opposite of fading into the background. The second trend is virtual reality. This one is arguably even further from the point. It takes you right out of the real world and into a simulated one. No, no, no. So, what does Weiser actually mean by ubiquitous invisible computing? He's talking about light switches, thermostats, stereos and ovens. Mmm, pie. These are the types of units of computing that will help to activate the real world in a big interconnected network. 
key facets of such a world of computers will be location and scale. So, let's take a closer look at what Weiser and his lab buddies are envisioning. Their ubiquitous computing world is based on tabs, pads, and boards. These are interactive surfaces of varying sizes, from something the size of a post-it note, to a piece of paper, to a bulletin board. Weiser describes a typical room filled with over 100 tabs, 10 to 20 pads, and 1 to 2 boards. We'll start with a tab. Aw, oh, so cute. A tab is the smallest component of Weiser's computer world. It's designed to extend the usefulness of small computers, like calculators, and small compendiums of information, like organizers. Active badges, which are clip-on computers similar to an employee ID, were the first version of a tab-like device pioneered by researchers at Cambridge Research Labs. These badges can keep track of people or objects they are attached to. Here's a guy. His name is Nicholas, and he's wearing a badge. This is Nicholas's door, which only opens for him and his room, which greets him by name. No matter where Nicholas is in the building, telephone calls, which are sometimes made on inexplicably retro handsets, can be forwarded to wherever Nicholas is. Any computer terminal can receive and activate Nicholas's preferences when he sits down to use them. And forget spending hours writing down all your meetings and appointments, Diaries or organizers, when activated by a badge, can write themselves. The most useful aspects of tabs may be their portability and their interactivity. Users would be able to shrink windows from a computer onto a tab display. This display could also serve simultaneously as an active badge, calendar, and diary. Using a collection of tabs, people can arrange their computer-based projects around their terminal, and tabs can be gathered up like papers and taken to meetings to be called up on other displays. Now let's look at a pad. Wiser calls pads scrap computers, as anyone can be used at any time for any task, just like grabbing a piece of scrap paper to sketch out an idea. They have no individualized identity or importance. They can even be used together, so the size of the display is flexible. For example, combining nine pads, an architect could draw out, edit, or review a set of blueprints without being restricted to a small screen. Each pad would be capable of displaying a portion of the blueprint. The largest of the three surfaces is the board. You can imagine this surface being used for a number of purposes, including bulletin boards for example, or video screens in home theatre systems. Look, here's Nicholas enjoying bullet with a bucket of popcorn. Boards can also be used as interactive whiteboards or flip charts. A board could even act as an electronic bookcase from which texts could be downloaded to a pad or a tab. Researchers at PARC have made prototype boards interactive with the use of wireless electronic chalk. But what boards really help enable is electronically mediated collaboration in a size suitable for group interaction. A room without tabs, pads, and boards would not appear to be much different from a room with them. Wiser envisions a world in which computer interaction casually enhances every room. Each computer is seamlessly connected with every other computer, not just within the room, but to other rooms and buildings. It would enable people to connect across the world in a more natural, integrated way. Weiser happily imagines the most pleasing and useful functions of tabs. 
They would be able to animate previously inanimate objects. They could beep to help you locate misplaced papers, books, or other items. And they could even open the right drawer or folder automatically, which would eliminate the need to physically search for anything. Finally, they could also personalize your environment, adjusting elements such as the size of text on a display or the volume of a presentation automatically. So, can you picture it? Can you imagine what your life would be like in Wiser's world? Let's give it a try. Close your eyes. Go on, close your eyes. Sal awakens. She smells coffee. A few minutes ago, her alarm clock, alerted by her restless rolling before waking, had quietly asked, Coffee? Sal looks out her windows at her neighborhood. Sunlight and a fence are visible through one, but through others she sees electronic trails that have been kept for her of neighbors coming and going during the early morning. Privacy conventions and practical data rates prevent displaying video footage, but time markers and electronic tracks on the neighborhood map let Sal feel cozy in her street. Glancing at the windows to her kids' room, she can see that they got up 15 and 20 minutes ago and are already in the kitchen. At breakfast, Sal reads the news. She still prefers the paper form, as most people do. She spots an interesting quote from a columnist in the business section. She wipes her pen over the newspaper's name, date, section, and page number, and then circles the quote. The pen sends a message to the paper, which transmits the quote to her office. Electronic mail arrives from the company that made her garage door opener. She lost the instruction manual and asked them for help. They have sent her a new manual and also something unexpected, a way to find the old one. According to the note, she can press a code into the opener and the missing manual will find itself. In the garage, she tracks a beeping noise to where the oil-stained manual had fallen behind some boxes. Sure enough, there is a tiny tab the manufacturer had affixed in the cover to try to avoid email requests like her own. On the way back to work, Sal glances in the four-view mirror to check the traffic. She spots a slowdown ahead and also notices on a side street the telltale green in the four-view of a food shop, and a new one at that. She decides to take the next exit and get a cup of coffee while avoiding the jam. Once Sal as she walks into the building, the machines in her office prepare to log her in, but don't complete the sequence until she actually enters her office. Sal glances out her windows. A grey day in Silicon Valley, 75% humidity and 40% chance of afternoon showers. Meanwhile, it has been a quiet morning at the East Coast office. Usually the activity indicator shows at least one spontaneous urgent meeting by now. The telltale by the door that Sal programmed her first day on the job is blinking. Fresh coffee. She heads for the coffee machine. Coming back to her office, Sal picks up a tab and waves it to her friend Joe in the design group, with whom she is sharing a virtual office for a few weeks. Virtual office sharing can take many forms. In this case, the two have given each other access to their location detectors and to each other's screen contents and location. Sal chooses to keep miniature versions of all Joe's tabs and pads in view, and three-dimensionally correct in a little suite of tabs in the back corner of her desk. She can't see what anything says, but she feels more in touch with his work when noticing the displays change out of the corner of her eye, and she can easily enlarge anything if necessary. A blank tab on Sal's desk beeps and displays the word Joe on it. She picks it up and gestures with it towards her live board. Joe wants to discuss a document with her, and now it shows up on the wall as she hears Joe's voice. Hey Sal, having a good day? Okay, you can open your eyes again. Wiser understood that his vision for ubiquitous computing was contingent on three critical factors. Computers, networks, and software systems. For his vision to come true, 
computers would need to get increasingly cheaper and be very low power. Networks would need to be powerful enough to connect an increasingly large number of terminals over great distances. And software systems would need to be designed for ubiquitous applications. So, let's take a look at Weiser's predictions of technological advancement for the 2000s compared against where we are today. He predicted that high contrast displays of 1000 by 800 pixels would be a fraction of a centimeter thick and would carry 16 megabytes of onboard memory. Today, we have a display that's 2880 by 1800 pixels, 1.5 millimeters thick, with 1600 megabytes of memory. It's called the MacBook Pro. He also predicted matchbox-sized external memory of 60 megabytes and that larger storage devices of 1 terabyte would become common. Today, our very common 1 terabyte storage devices are a fraction the size of a matchbox. Some of the advances in technology that seem so commonplace today, Wiser hadn't even imagined. USB drives, for instance. Or even simply the idea that you don't have to shut down a computer each and every time you want to connect an external piece of hardware, like a mouse or a webcam, to it. How about cloud computing? Or the ubiquity of the World Wide Web? Computer for the 21st Century is a fascinating article that gives us a unique glimpse into the visions of scientists over 20 years ago for our technological future. So why then, given that we've clearly surpassed what Weiser saw as the requisite advancements in technology, do his visions for ubiquitous computing still seem to be part of a sci-fi narrative? What do you think?